uh, before the meeting starts, thank you for joining the Washington County Road Commission for our October the 20th virtual working session. Before we start the session, there are a few housekeeping items I would like to cover. Number one, if you would like to make public comment during this meeting, we will prompt you at the appropriate time in the agenda to virtually raise your hand. If you are viewing the mute, if you are viewing the meeting on your computer, first make sure to click join audio. You can then raise your hand by clicking the participants button at the bottom of your screen and then the raise hand button at the bottom right of your screen. If you dialed into the meeting from your touchtone phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star 9. Once we get to the public comment section on the agenda, we will unmute participants with raised hands one at a time. The chat feature on this Zoom meeting is available only as technical support for users on their computer or smartphone. If you are experiencing technical issues with audio or video during the meeting, submit a comment in the chat feature and our IT manager will help you troubleshoot. The audio and video of this meeting is being recorded. I repeat, the audio and the video of this meeting is being recorded. A link to the video will be posted to wcroads.org in the coming days. Today's meeting agenda is posted on wcroads.org and there is a link available in the chat if you are joining us from your computer. I will all now call the meeting to order and we will start with a roll call and Doug will call the roll to identify commissioners and directors. Each commissioner present needs to identify where they are physically sitting present from some township in Washtenaw County, Michigan. Currently speaking is the chairman, Doug Fuller, Sio Township, Washtenaw County, Michigan. Vice Chair Barb Fuller, you there? Barb Fuller connected remotely, Sharon Township, Washtenaw County, Michigan. Commissioner Green. Good morning, I'm Roderick Green. I'm in Superior Township, Washtenaw County, Michigan. Thank you. Commissioner Yamas. Hello, I'm Gloria Yamas. I'm in Pittsfield Township, Washtenaw County, Michigan. Thank you, and Commissioner McCollum. Hello, I'm Joanne McCollum. I'm in Washtenaw County in Ypsilanti Township, and I am remotely connected. Thank you. Um, Managing Director, Ms. Siddell. Um, as a staff person, I don't believe we have to identify where we are at since we're not okay. voting. So I will simply indicate that I am present. Thank you. Mr. McDonnell. Present. Mr. Harmon. Present. Mr. Ackerman. Here. Wonderful. Thank you. Everybody is present and accounted for. Now we come to the public comment on our agenda. And if you would like to make public comment, please virtually raise your hand now. If you are viewing the meeting on your computer, first make sure to click join audio. You can then raise your hand by clicking the participants button at the bottom of your screen and then the raise hand button at the bottom right of your screen. If you dialed into the meeting from your touchstone phone, you can virtually raise your hand by dialing star nine. The meeting host will unmute participants with raised hands one at a time. The host will announce your username or the last four digits of your phone number when it is your turn to speak. As with all of our meetings, while this is a time to receive comments from the public, this is not intended to be a period for dialogue. Each person will be allocated three minutes to address the board. Emily, 
do we have people that would like to address us? At this time, Commissioner, we do not have anyone with a raised hand. Okay, fine. Thank you. And we will proceed into the balance of the uh, agenda. And the next thing on my agenda um, is um, a summary of the Washtenaw County Home Toxics Program. Cheryl, would you like to lead this conversation? Sure. Um, I'm going to quickly turn this over to Theo Egermont, who um, is the County Public Works Director. Um, but this really is coming about from a couple of months ago um, before this body uh, was a request to build a shed next door. And as part of that discussion, um, there were some questions about what really is taking place next door. So I thought that um, Theo could give us a brief presentation on the Home Toxics Program, which is really a um, a wonderful program that we have available to us in Washtenaw County. Um, so with that, Theo, if I could hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as Cheryl said, I'm the Public Works Director here at Washtenaw County, um, and I am housed within um, the Water Resources Commissioner's Office. Um, and we used to be, let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to shrink this here for me um, real quick. I've got some notes on a different page. Um, as a full screen, there we go. Um, so we're housed in the Water Resources Commissioner's Office. Uh, we used to be housed in environmental health and there's a planning component to what we do. We manage the um, solid waste plan overall. So we, we do a lot of things. I'm gonna focus in on specifically our home toxics program. Um, and so I've been here for two and a half years. I'm a transplant from Minnesota. I came here for grad school and decided to stick around because it's usually about 20 degrees warmer in the winter. So next slide. Um, so first talk about the, the big picture, why we do what we do. Um, then we'll I'll talk about operations and how we do those things. Then I'll give you a little comparison about um, how we compare to other counties and how we manage uh, this particular waste stream. Um, and then some details um, here and there and why not again to bigger picture um, and ask any questions that you've got. So next slide. So we, uh, we get rid of a lot of nasty stuff um, that people don't want um, and we take a lot of it and the stuff is particularly hazardous if it gets out into the environment. So we wanna make sure that it's collected and put into the proper places um, and disposed of properly or treated properly. So overall, um, the Home Toxics Program has taken in over 4 million pounds of household hazardous waste, including about 365,000 pounds last year alone. Um, as you can tell, we've, we've been a growing program. Um, if you take the last you know, 15 years and divide by 365, you'll see that we're taking in more and more all the time. Um, and we serve over 5,000 residents um, at this facility um, next door. So um, we also have a number of other programs. So we have a, a pharmaceutical collection program. Uh, we don't actually collect any of that ourselves because some of those uh, we're not authorized to do that. Uh, we have a school recycling program. We do county cleanup days, which I'll talk about specifically since that's also related. And I think um, you might have an interest in that as well since that prevents some illegal roadside ditching or dumping. Um, and then we also do a uh, business recognition and support program, and we conduct some special assessment programs for lakes where we treat invasive weeds. Um, and just to note, we also take another 120,000 pounds of this type of material at our county cleanup days. So our total amount of home toxics that we collect through all of our programs is um, almost half a million pounds last year. So next slide. So part of why this is important, um, DDT was banned in 1972. And if you look at some of the research, it says that, um, like CDC says that we all have some level of detectable DDE, which is um, what DDT breaks down into. Um, and that a lot of our foods actually contain some DDT. So this stuff has been banned for, um, almost 50 years and we're still finding it pervasive in the environment. So some of these nasty chemicals that we've got um, end up sticking around for a long time and we wanna make sure that they're, um, that we get rid of them appropriately. Same thing with lead where 
that's been banned for a long time and we still see it popping up in um, percentages of our population. So we're trying to get this stuff so it doesn't leak out into the environment and that we collect it and get rid of it properly. So that stuff isn't good for us and we wanna keep it out of us and out of the environment. So next slide. So we are located next door. Um, we're just a quarter mile down the road from uh, the 94 on-ramp. Uh, we operate, we're open to the public. We have um, Saturday collections, April through November. Um, and then we're also open um, throughout the week, Monday to Friday, and we take appointments for individuals. Um, we're seeing a, a change in our patterns where we we take in. We used to take in a lot more people on Saturdays. We launched an online appointment schedule, um, and we're actually seeing a number of people use that service on weekdays. So we become more convenient for folks, and we're seeing that we're taking in almost as many people on weekdays as we are on the weekends throughout the year. Um, but so far this year, we've collected 188,000 pounds of waste um, to be reused, recycled, or properly disposed of. And if you figure out how much that weighs, it's roughly about the same as a thousand square foot house, just as a comparison of what type of volume we take. Uh, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, we were available to the public, uh, both on weekdays and weekends. Um, our service is free of charge, but we do accept donations and that helps us um, get rid of our materials since it, we, uh, we don't require anyone to pay, but it does cost us and we're not a tax funded program. Our, our funding does not come through the general fund. We have a, a host agreement with the landfill um, and that's what ends up paying for those um, disposal fees. So we wanna um, offer the public a chance to support what they're getting rid of and that helps offset some of our costs. We are limited to Washtenaw County residents. Uh, we don't take business waste. Um, that puts us into a new category um, where we have more regulation um, and we're, we're not set up to do that. Uh, the exception is pesticides. The state gives us a grant um, to collect pesticides and reimburses us for those costs. And as a part of that, we're allowed to take uh, pesticides. So from time to time, there'll be a business that goes out of operation and they'll drop off um, pallet loads of pesticides and then they're on site for a day and our, uh, our contractor comes and picks those all up. Um, and then Saturday collection events, we're open first three Saturdays of the month, April to November. And we typically will see about 200 cars come through on a typical Saturday. Um, same thing, services free, but donations are accepted. Um, and we, we don't require appointments on those days. So people come through and usually have a 10 to 30 minute wait. Um, it's a pretty popular service. So next slide. Just to give you an idea of what we take, uh, we take a lot of paints, uh, stains, um, a lot of automotive fluids, batteries of all types, um, a lot of flammable material, pesticides, as I mentioned before, smoke detectors, uh, mercury. We get some interesting mercury things in from time to time. Um, we've seen a bracelet from France that had mercury in it, which to me seems like a horrible idea. Um, and we take sharps and we'll also give out containers to folks um, if they don't have a replacement container. Uh, we don't take things like ammunition or explosives, um, appliances or tires at this facility, um, construction waste or significant others. Just see it if you're paying attention. Um, <laughs> and what do we do with this stuff? Uh, so we prioritize reuse whenever we can. Um, that's part of our goal is to um, use things that are available. So our latex paint, if, if it's in really good condition, um, we'll end up giving that to a, a nonprofit in Detroit that uses it to paint homes. So it is getting reused. Um, if our paint's in decent condition, we work with our contractor um, to get that recycled and processed into new paint. Um, so they'll blend it into like five different colors and then um, sell it at a lower cost. Um, again, a nonprofit group. Um, and then we've I think it was just last year we um, worked with the Westerdale Foundation in Detroit um, to get our usable aerosol spray paint um, to an artist um, collective. And so they'll do murals and things like that um, with spray paint. Um, and then next slide. We also um, reuse a number of our materials through our contractors. 
Um, so our contractor will send gasoline to be reused um, in a type of facility that can use mixed gases um, and combust them to run equipment. Um, fluorescent tubes are recycled alkaline batteries. Um, they use both the metals as well as um, some of the minerals that are part of that. They can process and then they use them as fertilizer. Um, and then our acids and bases, they put those together so that they become neutralized um, to the point where they're not hazardous. So a number of things, making sure that they get processed appropriately and if we can reuse them um, and still have a valuable use, um, that's the, the way we wanna go. So we prioritize that when we pick our contractors. Next slide. Um, I know one of the things that came up that people might have some questions is about safety. Um, safety is our number one priority. We do have two Haswhopper 40-hour certified um, team members on our staff, um, soon to be three. We have a, we had a retirement this summer and our uh, training for that individual has been delayed due to COVID. Um, we're registered, registered with the Sio Fire, Fire Department, um, also next door conveniently under right to know. So we tell them where all of our materials are and what they are um, so that in the worst case scenario, um, they would know what would go where. Uh, we also conduct weekly um, inspection of are all our barrels sealed properly? Is anything leaking? What is going on back there every week? So we have a big checklist to make sure that um, everything is done properly and stored properly. Um, we have secondary containment for things that are larger quantities, oil, gas, antifreeze, um, to make sure that if there was a leak, it wouldn't leak out onto the pavement or um, anywhere else into the environment. Uh, we also take a number of other precautions. Uh, we seal the storm drain just outside um, of our fenced area. Um, we're on site five to six days a week. We label all our drums and materials and follow the regulations. Um, and we have materials on hand for, for small spills. We're also working with um, collecting goods for a contractor to come out in case there were a larger spill in the worst case scenario um, that they could respond um, very quickly. Um, and just an example of um, we've trained staff in such a way that they have also prioritized safety. Um, I came out a couple weeks ago to um, implement a new cash handling procedure and our specialist, um, we had maybe 40 cars in line and I just came in to say, hey, what do you need help with? And he said, you know, we can use a little help with this over there, but he stopped, held up what he was doing and made sure to run through a safety check, making sure that I had the property, proper PPE on, that I knew where the eyewash was, where I knew where the first aid kit was and what to do in case of X, Y, and Z. So everybody who comes in to help has that level of, here's what we need to do all the time. And that's the priority. Um, so next slide. Just to give you a little bit of a comparison of um, how our facility compares to other counties. Um, noting that um, this is a little bit old, it's from 2017, um, and we should have our numbers as a part of the, the total or the average. Um, this was a PowerPoint slide and that was the member who re retired, but it's um, it gives you an idea of how we compare. So the percentage of the population that participates in our program um, and the as far as a household basis, we'd be considered the number two in the state. Um, by per capita participation in our program. So we figure that's pretty good um, and we're, we're always trying to get better. Next slide. And as far as customer service, um, as far as number of hours that we're open, we did a competitive analysis looking at those other programs for how often they're open and we're the most available program in the state based on those hours that were available. Um, we did launch a new online appointment system um, and we've seen a big increase um, of appointments. Last year, we had about 1,200 appointments. Um, and this year, we expect we're going to have about 1,600, even with being shut down for a couple of months due, due to COVID. Um, so that service is being well received. Uh, we are donation based. We don't hassle any of our customers. Um, we want to make sure that if people can't afford it, that they can still drop off their stuff appropriately. Um, so. Again, that's a illegal dumping prevention measure. And we we train staff appropriately to you say, if you'd like to make a donation, not here's how much you should pay. 
Um, and let's see, we launched a customer survey last year too to look at um, how are we doing, what can we do better at. Um, we found that 88% of respondents were very likely to recommend the survey to a, or the service to a friend, and 98.7% said that the service met their needs. So we're we're very happy with that. And next slide. And we also take the show on the road. So we, we do a county cleanup day um, at four to five locations throughout the year. Um, and we collect both the home toxics as well as um, electronics, tires, um, bulky waste, construction debris, that kind of thing. Um, we do have a grant to collect tires. So we typically don't end up spending it all. Um, if the road commission has um, Piece of property around that they would also like to pair up and partner up to collect tires we'd be happy to do a, a tire collection day in collaboration um, as i mentioned we we collect a lot of material here electronics is a growing source of um, waste and we send those to a um, contractor that collects that material reprocesses it and uses what they can um, so it's and they're certified as a an e2 certified um, it's a standard that um, says they're not sending it overseas to be um, stripped out and put in acid baths and things. It's, it stays in the U.S. So um, we select our vendors to make sure they have appropriate um, certifications. Um, we collect at these county cleanup days, we collect about a half a million pounds of material annually, including about 40,000 pounds of, of tires. Um, so with that, I'll uh, take any questions if you want to go to the next slide. I'll also mention that um, if you're interested in our programs and our metrics, I do have a link on the last bottom right corner there um, that shows here's all the things that we do and the amount of things that we take. And I should mention, I also have Lauren Koloski also on the um, line. She's our environmental supervisor so she works with me she's got a, a longer history of environmental compliance and regulation than than i have i have a question yeah. bill joanne mccullum um which landfill do you know which landfill that you that they're taking the um products to the waste uh, so, yeah so it would vary by uh, material so we send it to our contractor U.S. Ecology is our, our primary one. Um, they're located out of Detroit. Um, so I'm guessing it's one of the, I don't know which specifically they take which materials, but it would be one in, uh, excuse me, Wayne County most likely. Okay. Um, also the, the tires, I've always, uh, when I've called to inquire about that on cleanup day, there is a limit to how many tires you take per household or whatever, right? Um, so we, we list on our flyers that we will take four, um, what we'd say for free, um, but then we'd recommend having a donation um, just to help us with labor costs um, to help get people there uh, for over that amount. Um, it's, there are some DOT regulations, I believe. I don't think you can haul more than 12 tires um, unless you're certified under the state to do that. So that would be our, our limit. Okay, thank you. It's a very good program. Yeah, you're welcome. Do we have any other questions for Theo? So Theo, I don't know whether this, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Cheryl. I don't know if there's a question for Theo. I'm trying to recall specifically what my interest was in the layout of the facility next door. And as I recall, uh, it seemed like a hot mess. <laughs> that there were items scattered about and it, it just looked risky to me. So I don't know whether that's appropriate for Thea or anybody else can help me remember. Seems like Jim, I talked, you responded to that in terms of potential revisions of the layout next door. I just can't remember, but that was my interest in what was going on at that facility next door. 
So I don't know, Theo, if you have any um, answer for that or if that's something that we can look further into. I, it looks like there's been some cleanup effort um, next door, uh, and I'm not sure who's been leading that effort. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I, I'm not sure on the, the time scale which you looked at it last. Um, when I came on board in 2018, um, I saw this as a program that I wanted to focus on. And so I, and we also had the staffing ability to add a, a full-time staff member. Uh, previously, we had a staff member who was doing multiple programs. And I wanted to say this program deserves a person or um, this program should have one person who's fully dedicated to it. And then the rest of the team helps support that. Um, so we've, we've done that and we've instituted a lot of different safety measures, as I mentioned, customer service measures. Um, we are noticing that we are getting a lot more. Um, we've increased the number of people that use the service. And so depending on if you're there right after we've had a really busy day, um, there might be things on carts um, and we roll those under um, the shed so that they don't get rained on. Um, so depending on when you're looking at things, we might have, we might have had a really busy day and we're collecting materials. We are, we are always working on um, figuring out a better layout in order to accommodate those materials better. Um, long term, we are looking at, I should say maybe medium to short term, trying to find a or expand our space so that we can um, store those materials in a, a better way. Um, additionally, we'd, we'd really like to have a berm all the way around our facility. Um, it's another safety measure that we'd like to move in that direction. But um, if anyone's interested, be happy to give a tour and show the place around. Or you're, you're more than welcome to make a, an appointment and drop off things too. That's another way to see what's going on. So Theo, how often are contractors are contractors coming in to pick up materials then? I mean, obviously it sounds like you're doing sorting as you're as people are dropping things off. Yeah, so um, we have um, our contractor, US Ecology, come out every week or every two weeks to pick up things. Um, and then we also have um, oil and antifreeze. Um, those pickups happen at the same time too. And uh, depending on which container we've got, um, we'll have up to 500 gallons of, of oil on hand at a time. And again, that's got secondary containment. Um, and we'll pick those up every two weeks usually. Um, Theo, if you don't mind, I'll, I wanted to chime in quickly with that. Um, yeah. So a lot of things that we've made changes with, like, as Theo mentioned, is we're doing, um, US Ecology comes in and does pretty much weekly pickups. I'm um, having the antifreeze and the oil picked up at least, uh, at least once a month. Um, Nothing stays on our site over a year. Um, it's very rarely that it stays on our site over a month at this time. Um, we've, eliminating, we've eliminated storing materials behind the shed. Um, so that was a practice that was happening before uh, Theo and I came on. Um, and now that's just, so you might look out there and see a bunch of um, empty gas cans. Um, and those are just empty ones that actually come in that we'll hand out to residents to um, to replace uh, the um, the ones that they brought into us that they no longer want. Um, and then also back there, you might see some empty drums, but those are all empty drums that say I fill up with my gasoline in the shed area, I'll roll one of those drums over and then fill that up. Um, but there is no material stored behind the shed and anything that's stored outside of the shed area um, we're looking at batteries, or they're all in Gaylord boxes with a lined um, plastic liner. And as Theo mentioned, we are we do daily and weekly inspections to check for any sort of spills. I have berms around the oil containers, um, so we we have changed a lot of things. So it might look a little um, disorganized, but I can assure you that we know what everything is. We know when we started accumulating it, and we know when we have to dispose of it. Commissioner Barb Fuller, this is Jim. Um, I recall your concern was, you had a couple of concerns. One, reacting to uh, the current arrangements and keeping in mind there are multiple county uh, users 
on this leased property. Uh, Water Resource Commissioner Evan Pratt's office had a lot of materials and equipment stored, and I, I believe you had reacted to that appearance. And then with regard to this program, I recall your concern was, what are the pollution prevention measures and spill containment measures that are in place? So I, I recall questions, should there be a spill uh, potential impact on our property? And of course, th this is lease space, this is road commission property, but it's immediately adjacent to our main yard facilities. So I recall those concerns and, and, and questions. Um, to answer the, the first part, I had met with Sean O'Hare and Jason Fee of the county. Um, they, they readily acknowledged that things were becoming a bit untidy and uh, committed to developing a better arrangement going forward and working with the various county departments um, to clean up the area, get things more organized. Uh, and they were also sensitive to the, the board's concerns about uh, appearance from Sio Township, our neighbor. And uh, they had actually removed some construction debris, temporary fencing that was on Sio Township's property from the original construction of the Western Service Center in 1999. So progress was made, uh, relationships were established, and um, I, I expect that that things will improve here over time. Thanks, Jim. Does anyone have any further questions? I, I guess I have one question. I'm just curious, Theo. Um, you talked about requesting doma donations as um, as opposed to sort of suggesting an amount like other agencies may do. Do you find that you bring in more or less or we're pretty much on par with other agencies um, by having a, a friendlier methodology? Um, I don't know the amounts that other um, counties take in as far as donations. Um, some have different schedules. Um, there's definitely different fee structures where some are funded by, it's on a special assessment um, where they'll pay for that. Some put um, fees on other services that provide for that service. Um, some are directly out of um, city, um, city budgets. Um, so ours is a little bit different. Ours is not set up to, um, we definitely don't make up what we pay. Um, as far as that, I, I think looking at our total budget, it's roughly a quarter of our um, cost to dispose of materials is made up by donations. Okay, but obviously a valuable service nonetheless. Right. And we'll be talking further about tires for we certainly do have more than our share of those as well. <laughs> Great. Anything else? All right, well, I'd like to thank Theo mm -hmm. and Lauren for joining us today. Um, appreciate the information. Um, and uh, like I said, I expect that we'll have further discussions. All right, thanks for having us. All right, have a great day. Thank you, Theo. Cheryl, you ready to move on to uh, trees? I think that we are. Um, I see that. Alan Philbrick has also joined us um, since he's been helping guide us through this conversation. Um, what I would like to do uh, with respect to the uh, tree discussion is we have a brief PowerPoint presentation that, that summarizes the various areas of the policy itself, of the draft policy. So I'd like to just sort of run through it, at least what staff's intent was with respect to the various areas of the policy. And then um, if we could talk about if there's any specific language um, changes that we'd like. And certainly as we're going along, if there's anything fundamentally or um, uh, that there's questions about or, or there's something that we'd like to discuss, um, we can certainly do that as well. Um, mm -hmm. But we can bring the policy itself up uh, when we're done sort of going through a general overview here. Um, so um, obviously we have our draft tree policy. So Emily, if we could go to the next slide, please. The first part of the policy that we put together was the overall intent of the policy. 
Um, first and foremost, acknowledging the importance of trees, especially to the, um, the Washtenaw County community. We know that that is an important asset um, and we want to make sure that, that, that that's acknowledged um, up front. Um, also trying to explain um, as part of it why um, we would um, either remove or trim trees. Um, and essentially overall, the, the policy then is to provide guidance to staff on, on how those decisions would be made. Uh, next slide, please. And then we provide some background and that is essentially um, talking about the road right of way. Um, obviously, we're talking about narrow swaths when it really comes down to it of land um, throughout the county. Um, and the road right of way serves many purposes. Um, and obviously, um, on most of our road rights of way, it's also an area where we have naturally occurring uh, vegetation and a lot of trees. Um, but that right of way also serves uh, road purposes or transportation purposes. Um, and some of those purposes are. Um, should uh, we have an errant driver that there be room for recovery. Uh, we know how important sight distance is um, as you're driving along the roadway, whether you're talking about intersection sight distance or those that might be um, inside of curves to, or vertical curvature to be able to see as you're um, making decisions and driving. Uh, we certainly need room for maintenance activities. We receive a fair amount of snow and we need some place to put it. Um, we also have most of our drainages within the road right of way, whether that would be storm sewer and enclosed drainage systems, or that would be an open ditch type system. And again, a sense of openness for drivers um, as they are being able to mm -hmm. feel safe and confident operating vehicles along the roadway. Next slide, please. Um, so having um, stated the overall intent and, and some of the background information, um, we started looking at um, when would we be looking at uh, potential tree implications. And so again, fundamentally, um, looking at setting up any project um, where we would potentially have planning and design considerations. Um, staff would start um, with the, um, the basis that we would be minimizing impact to trees whenever possible um, and make sure that anything um, that is done would be necessary. But there certainly are times when we know that trees would need to be removed and would need to be or trimmed. Um, but again, starting with that fundamental attempt to minimize the impacts um, whenever we possibly can. Next slide, please. So then we started talking about um, if we are into a trimming or a removal situation. And we started first with a definition of a tree, um, which actually caused a great deal of discussion among staff. Um, and ultimately what we're using is the, is the same definition that MDOT and others have used um, that work in this field and that the policy would apply, trees would be defined as anything that would be six inches or greater in diameter. Um, and so that's where the specific policy would be applying. But we also understand that we do have trees that are less than six inches of diameter and quite a bit of brush within the road right of way. And so that would be um, more at staff discretion for anything that would be smaller than six inches in diameter. Next slide, thank you. Um, and then we outlined some of the times when we would be looking at either removal or trimming. And very specifically, that would be related to road and drainage improvements. Um, and uh, we have quite a few different types of projects that we could be doing. Um, we do have areas where we've had uh, high crash frequency of trees along the roadway. Intersections, um, whether they be um, with public roads or at railroads, um, where we may need to uh, do, again, removal or trimming um, for sight distance purposes. Uh, we have curves, we have both horizontal curves um, where we would need um, to have potential concerns with sight distance within the curve or there may be target trees on the outside of a curve. We also have uh, vertical curves, which are basically hill crests and sags where uh, sometimes it's difficult to see as you're going over or as, as you're, you've just crested and, and you may have your vision obstructed as you're going down a hill. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we do have areas where um, trees are causing specific problems um, with either the pavement or with areas where it's shading and um, it's unable to let um, sunshine and light in so that we have um, repeated uh, freezing and hazardous conditions created by certain shading circumstances. Um, we certainly have our share of fallen trees where they've come across the roadway. Um, and we have quite a few requests for dead tree removal. And then um, there are times when we um, may have a circumstance where we have a potentially hazardous tree as well. So we've tried to outline um, the specific areas where we would be looking at tree trimming or removal. Next slide, please. Um, then we talked a bit about uh, within the policy about notification. Um, we certainly have our community engagement policy and procedure, which we would um, be continue to be committed to following. And that would be any time we would have significant tree removal or tree trimming, where we would be reaching out um, to the community. Um, in addition, uh, certainly any of our more major major projects where we um, are holding public meetings, um, tree removal and, and is, is a component of those meetings as well. Um, and then as far as notification, uh, when we would be removing uh, trees, we notify the adjacent property owner. Um, typically we have a wood disposal form where we would be asking the property owner if they would like the wood to be left on site or removed um, as part of the tree removal process. Next slide, please. So should we be in a position where we needed to do any form of tree removal, um, we started talking about tree replacement. Um, so uh, as we know, um, we are somewhat limited with our ability to do tree replacement based on funding source primarily. But we did say, take a look at there may be projects when if possible, um, we can explore options for tree replacement. Um, a good example of that would be something like Jackson Boulevard, where we worked very closely with the SIO DDA. Um, there was enough area on a project like that where we um, had locations that um, could be landscaped. Um, we didn't have concerns with respect to um, safety, whether it be uh, roadside obstacles or uh, intersection site distance. There are still other areas where trees could be planted and planted safely. Um, and then the funding source in, in that particular situation came from the township DDA. Um, so we were able to work with the township and include those in the project, um, in that type of a project. There may be other grant opportunities, whether road commission staff are the ones who are actually soliciting those grants or whether we would um, support another um, entity um, that may be um, seeking funding for um, tree replacement. We'd be more than happy to um, support those efforts where we can. We also have property owners, whether they be private property owners or again, townships that may be interested in doing some form of planting. Um, and we do have a process um, through our permit rules and regulations where we would allow that to take place within the road right of way and certainly would encourage um, that to uh, be an option available as well. Next slide, please. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure that we recognize we have third parties that do do a fair amount of tree work within um, the road right of way, um, whether it be that we issue a permits, so let's say it be a non-motorized path that would be going in um, where a township has hired a contractor to do that type of work. Um, we certainly have um, utility companies that come in and pull permits in order to be able to do tree work. Um, again, uh, any the intent would be um, through the permit process that we would certainly make um, ap applicants aware of our policy and they would be expected to, to comply and to minimize um, any of their tree impacts as well when they're doing that work under permit. Next slide, please. All right, um, so I guess the intent there was to just provide an overview of the policy um, and so, uh, before we talk about the next steps, which would be really um, trying to uh, get this policy out um, for additional comment, I was hoping that we could at least take a look at the language itself that we have in the policy um, and see if there's any questions or concerns um, with respect to the overall direction of the policy itself or if specific language within the policy amongst the board members. 
So Emily, if you could put the um, policy up. Uh, is it not showing, Cheryl? I've got it shared. Okay, I can't see it. I don't know. Okay, hold on one second. Let me start again here. I have the policy that you sent to us. Can you see it now? I <laughs> cannot, but I did. You are correct, Gloria. I did send the policy, so people should have mm -hmm. it available. I don't know why we're not seeing it. How about now? There we go. Yes. All right. The third that time's a charm. <laughs> so I guess um, overall, I guess open for discussion, for comment, for thoughts, whether they be general thoughts or specific language thoughts. I thought the um, language was very clear and self-explanatory. I, I like the um, policy. It's very clear. There's nothing to try and interpret or figure out. It says what it says it's going to do. So I thought it was pretty good. Well, thank you, Joanne. I, I have comments, Cheryl, I don't know how you want to do this. You want to go section by section or you just want me to share my thoughts? Um, I am more than happy to do it in either way. If you, unless others want, um, have general comments, I guess I'd be happy to just run through the language or if you have specific language and um, see what your suggestions are. And if others would like to discuss it before we make changes, we'd be happy to do that. And we can make changes right here. That's why I asked Emily to pull the language up um, so that we're all comfortable with where we land on the, the final draft language of the policy. Okay, so I'll just dive in. Under background, third paragraph, uh, second or third line, I would add farm equipment. That's been something I have heard when I'm out and about that overhanging branches are real hard on some of the bigger farm equipment pieces, knock mirrors off and whatever. Uh, so yes. that, that would be something I would recommend adding. Then on page three, under, well, at some point, I have notes at the bottom. It's my understanding that currently Michigan Transportation Fund dollars cannot be used for tree replacement. I'd like to see that stated somewhere to take that right off the table. Okay. Um, I'd also like it noted that the Washtenaw County Road Commission has no authority to change speed limits. Uh, which I think is important for people to understand. Um, and then where is our oak wilt prevention policy stated? Um, well, we don't have a specific policy with respect to that. That is a procedure that staff is adhering to, um, but it is not specifically stated within the policy. Do you, the, do you want the reason I believe it would be helpful is to diffuse any suggestions that we're not being conscientious in that regard. But I'd okay. certainly defer to you and your staff in terms of whether it's appropriate to put in a policy per se. Okay. Uh, we can take a look at whether there's something that we can put in there that broadens that, that, um, that procedures will be in place. I wouldn't want to limit it to oak wilt per se, if there's other things that may come along that we need to be equally um, cognizant of and respectful of as we are, you know, doing our practices. But if there's language we can add in there, we can certainly take a, um, put something in there to that effect. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, I just want to be able to demonstrate that we are respectful and sensitive to the comments that we receive as commissioners from the public. And when it, and I believe stating it in our policy might be helpful in that regard. Okay. So I'd like to add to that. And I think what Barb uh, 
don't know if she means, but what it made me think of is the the tree policies that we follow from the state that have to do with the bats, uh, oak, you know, environmentally oak wilt, mm -hmm. when not to cut oak, um, if it could be generalized that we try to follow all those policies. Yeah. Um, and um, that's what I, my thought was, because Jim has often spoke that we have to be careful about those times too, that we can't cut trees during bat migration and, and all of that. Right, exactly. And that's why we'll try, we can add something in there that makes it, yeah, exactly, Emily, that is, is broad enough to address all of those things because they, they do continue to change. And I wouldn't want to have a policy that's so specific that we're yes. coming right back to the board as soon as we get a new, um, you know, directive from whomever that may be. Right. Do we have other comments, whether there's specific language or areas that um, we've either missed or need to have better clarified? I think that I, I really thought this was well thought out. I think that, um, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but in conjunction with, because we're not the only county um, department that takes down trees, the park department does. Um, and so do some other departments. I don't know if it's worth mentioning in here or not, or if this is just specific to the road commission. I mean, I think when you mentioned that we may uh, look for grants in conjunction with other people, I think that's how you mm -hmm. stated it, right? I don't know if there has to be an IE or not. Um, well, the next one of the next steps um, is to share this um, policy once the, this board was comfortable um, with um, counterparts and the county board of commissioners um, for comment. And so certainly if there's opportunities to specifically call things out, that can make sense or we can leave it broad like this, understanding that if those opportunities um, come about, um, again, County Parks is an easy one because we've partnered with them on so many projects and frequently those paths do go on the road rights of way, but they also involve extensive tree removal. So they may have avenues available where if it's like a joint application for a grant, you know, opportunity, we couldn't, I, we can at least support that effort even if we can't necessarily, you know, dried it, so to speak. Um, but I don't know if we want to specifically call that out in here or if we just want to leave it open the way it is right now, knowing that the intent would be to continue to partner uh, moving forward. But I don't want to commit county parks without having at least let Koi have an opportunity and others to take a look at the policy itself. Right. Cheryl, I'd be certainly, I'd, I think Joanne's point is well taken. And I think your point are as well. And I'd also like to generally make the comment that clearly this is a much, we have given it a great deal of thought. I mean, you know, I, uh, I'd like to leave it as the specific concern, leave it open as possible, um, just with a, in my own mind, a general reference to the fact that the Road Commission remains eager uh, to consult with other people who have share our interests in the trees uh, within the county, whether that be, as you say, county parks uh, and other agencies that involve themselves with trees from time to time, as well as, of course, the county board itself. Um, one of the concerns that has been expressed, Barb's comment about things that we hear as commissioners has been expressed to me uh, many times over the years and in many different ways uh, is concerns about concerns by citizens about notification of when we're going to be doing things whether it's trimming or whether it's removals of trees um, 
I got an absolutely hysterical phone call a long time ago now from a resident um, whose children were at home and were petrified, and they called their father, who was conveniently at his office in Southfield, because somebody was cutting a tree in front of their house. Um, when we tracked that down, and Jim will probably recall this, we tracked this down, and it was, we were taking the, the, in response to a complaint from Dexter Schools, we were taking a branch down off a tree that was continually scraping school buses. And the, a tree crew was in that vicinity that day and had some time and it was on their list, so they went over and removed the offending branch. Case in point. Um, so I'm wondering if there's something that we can add to our arsenal of concerns about increasing our abilities to notify people when we are going to be doing tree work on or near their property. I'm at least as aware as anybody on staff about the potentials for that to get completely out of hand, but I'd like us to at least consider how we notify people, when we notify them, how could we better notify them? Um, so I just bring that up as a concern. So Mr. Chairman, do you believe our community engagement policy and procedure is inadequate in that respect? No, I do not. Or, or do needs, not. well, I, you know, and to that, I was gonna request the community engagement policy and procedure because I've not seen it um, to look because I had those same questions. Um, so I'd like to review that before we went further because I thought you addressed it in that. And if there seems to be something different that we could address it in that policy because that, that seems like a good policy that you use that policy and procedure, you know, instead of trying to state specifics in here. Um, if you could okay. send that to me, I appreciate it. And Commissioner Yamas, if you'll look in the big three ring binder that Emily put together for us for orientation, there's a really nice jumbo size paper with color in it um, about the community engagement policy. Okay. Right. And that really was depend not dependent on the type of project on the level of engagement. And it really was to try to balance expectations. I can appreciate that that may have been a traumatic experience that Commissioner Fuller just described. Having said that, to be able to notify every time we trim a tree, I think is gonna be a difficult for staff, frankly, to comply with. Um, but by trying to follow the community engagement policy, the intent there is to really, when we're doing significant tree removal, I mean, we wouldn't even just be notifying adjacent property owners, we would be engaging the public. So there would be a larger uh, notification um, or a community en engagement effort. At a minimum, when we're removing a tree, which again, we've defined a tree, so it's, it is six inches or greater, but when we're removing the tree, we would be engaging the individual property owners. I do know there's times when we've had individual property owners have been engaged, staff's done everything that they were to do along those lines. That property owner was um, supportive, um, signed off on the wood disposal permit, was well aware of the work that was taking place, and yet we've still had people contacting our organization um, as they've observed some of it. Um, I think, I'm not sure that staff could successfully commit to notifying the general public every time we take a tree down. I just don't think that that's a realistic expectation out of our staff. So we need to find that balance. And, and certainly where it's significant, again, we would be engaging the broader community when we're talking more on a tree by tree, we'd be working with individual property owners, but even that would have a limit to it. And that was the, the intent of my comment. Mm -hmm. there, we have to try and find a balance. Um, I was simply expressing concern that that is in the, 
however many years I've served here, that has been a consistent observation on the part of the public. Agreed. So, well, Cheryl, I know that DTE um, sends out a general, we will be trimming trees in this neighborhood sort of thing. Is that the type of thing that we send out? And they don't contact specific, um, their policy mirrors ours quite a bit, except for I do get um, a text message and just a general to, we're gonna be out in the area. I don't know how they managed to do that, but. Yeah, we have not been doing that to date, primarily because our tree trimming has really been um, more of a filler type work. Um, so we haven't um, engaged or done full on tree trimming in the manner that DTE does where they either contract it or have their own crews out and they are strategically daily going out in a certain area. So doing a general notification that they would be in Sio Township on such and such dates um, has made more sense for them. Uh, I can certainly talk to staff if there's opportunities where we know that for multiple days, potentially we would be working in an area if that's a reasonable expectation. Um, but again, a lot of times it's been filler work. It's been sort of sporadic as we can get to them. We are doing that type of work. Um, so the, the attempt for notification has been, uh, that's where we've been a little limited on that. And just to further that too, um, when we have a project planned, um, Commissioner Yamas, for like one of the um, local road agreements with a township, uh, if we know we're going to be in that ahead of a uh, project for that includes forestry, we do our best to try to include that at least on the weekly road work schedule that is emailed out and posted to the website. That's a little different than going door to door to get like a door knocker or, you know, to send a letter. But we do try to at this point with the community engagement procedure, we do try to at least get that on the weekly road work schedule um, to notify that we're doing forestry. And that's always, if it's in conjunction with a project, uh, just routine maintenance is what Cheryl was talking about where it's not included on um, any outreach and communications in that part. But when it's a project, we try our best to do that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, I think that um, staff can make the, the changes or comments that uh, we've just talked about. Um, and Emily, if you wouldn't mind putting up what our next steps were. Yep, hold on one second, let me get this up here. That's all good. All right, can you see that now? Uh, yes, we can all see right. that. All right, so next steps. So next slide, please. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so today we've reviewed the tree policy. We will go ahead and make the edits that we just talked about um, from staff. Then we will um, send out the draft policy uh, to, like I said, to the County Board of Commissioners um, and to their staff to for comment. And, and then we would like to ultimately post this online and also hold a virtual public meeting so that we can solicit as much comment as possible. Um, so that um, hopefully when we bring this back to the board for approval, what we have is a well vetted tree policy um, reflecting as much as we can um, and sort of balancing again, um, what we're hearing from our community and still um, carrying out the work that we need to carry out. So that is the intent for the next steps. Cheryl, Any questions uh, on that? Well, comment. I'd mm -hmm. sure like to see the policy with the additions, modifications and what have you that Emily, um, as we could all see, was noting throughout the review. I'd like to see that go back out to the commissioners Sure. for their comments to before it goes any further outside our own organization yep. so that yep. uh, all, all of the commissioners are on board with what we 
the changes that we made, which I think, by the way, were particularly Barb's comments, uh, were very to the point. So, um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Commissioners, uh, thoughts about the next steps? Looks good to me. I like um, the uh, next steps, the um, taking it uh, to county leadership and staff to the online so we can refer people. I definitely like the virtual public meeting mm -hmm. portion of it. I concur. So do I for... You know. All right. Um, Cheryl, can you give, would you care to hazard a, hazard a guess when we, when the commissioners could see um, a slightly, um, the revised version of, of this policy that, that we've been discussing? Mm -hmm. um, I will attempt to get the changes made within the next day or two. I will ask Alan Philbrick to take a peek at what we come up with to make sure he continues yes, to be comfortable with the policy that we are developing. Um, and then from there, we can send it on to the board. So I would say within a week. Seems, seems wonderful to me. Yeah, we know this is important. We are definitely trying to keep it moving along. Commissioners, any more comments? Rod, I've not heard anything from you yet. The next steps look good. I'm certainly looking forward to the virtual public meeting. Okay. Excellent. Barb, I heard you say you were happy. So um, with that, um, I'd like to move along if we can. And I do believe that uh, at this point, Cheryl would like to have us uh, take a little break. Yes, if we can. St um, I think all of us at times, some of these um, meetings have gone two and three hours. So we've asked if we could take a brief um, five to 10 minute break. What time is it right now? It's seven minutes after 10. So perhaps if we could say at 10.15, we will resume, give everybody an opportunity to stretch their legs and uh, sort of re-engage. I think that it'll make, make a, for a more productive discussion on the natural beauty road, which will be our last topic for today. Is everybody back? Yes, we're back. Cheryl? All right. Uh, so moving on the agenda, um, the next thing we have is the Natural Beauty Road um, process. We have a hearing coming up. We received a, a request for a Natural Beauty Road in, on Earhart Road in Ann Arbor Township. Um, so in preparation for that public hearing, which is next week, uh, we thought it would be beneficial to run through the entire process since ultimately uh, this board will be asked to make, to make a determination as to whether or not Earhart Road should be a natural beauty road. So with that, I'd like to hand this over to Brent. He can walk us through what that process is. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so Emily, you're running the slides, right? Correct. Okay, all right. Um, so to start off for Natural Beauty Road, so the goal of our Natural Beauty Road uh, process or the program is to acknowledge the natural character and of our certain county local roads and having unusual and outstanding natural beauty and to maintain those roads in accordance with accepted maintenance practices, uh, which are established by the Road Commission uh, for natural beauty roads. Um, so if you wanna move forward to the next slide, Emily. So our policy and procedure is based on the Public Act 451 in 1994, the Natural Beauty Road Act. Um, you can go to the next slide. So our process, just uh, very uh, briefly, um, and I think I supplied the our policy and procedure uh, and the act, I think, to the board uh, just to see that. 
So basically we receive the petition from the resident. Uh, we review that and they must have 25 uh, signatures uh, from freeholders within the township. Uh, and we send that to the township to review that. Uh, we schedule the public hearing and the public hearing needs to be scheduled based on the act within six months of the petition. Uh, so after that process, then we evaluate the roadway and we evaluate that based on the criteria that's developed within our policy. And I'll go through those later in the slides. Um, then after that, we report uh, the findings at the public hearing, and then we hear any comments from the public uh, about why they believe uh, this should or should not be a natural beauty road. We present a summary to the board, to the road commission board uh, with this, and then the, the road commission board then decides whether to approve or deny the natural beauty road request. Go ahead to the next slide. So this is just a, a slide of the petition itself uh, that's submitted to the resident. Typically they call us and they ask us uh, what that process is. We walk through that. Uh, with them and then we provide them the petition and then they get the signatures uh, for that. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So in our criteria, we, uh, we have, uh, let me count, one, two, three, four, five. We have eight different criteria that the roadway um, must meet, whether to grant or to withdraw the natural beauty designation. Uh, so the first one that we look at is the character of the road. Uh, the roadway must have outstanding natural features and uh, must be unique and distinctive to uh, uh, amongst other roadways. We have a lot of beautiful roads within Washtenaw County, and, uh, but we really look to see whether it's unique and distinct. Uh, it sets itself aside. Uh, this can be in the eye of the beholder and we realize that, uh, but we report back what, what we found as far as uh, um, the vegetation and uh, how it somewhat compares to that. And then based on the, the comments that we hear at the public hearing. Um, so this can include uh, such native vegetation, such as shrubs and wildflowers and grasses and ferns, and uh, the open areas should be scenic, uh, scenic and have natural vistas. Uh, so uh, those are uh, things that we look at whenever we're looking at the character of the road. You can go to the next slide. So the length of the road, the length and the volume. So the, uh, in order to qualify, it must be at least a half mile in continuous length, and it should not exceed 500 vehicles per day. Uh, you can go to the next one. So development, uh, if there's development that is along the segment of road that is being requested, uh, then it should be compatible with the surroundings and it shouldn't detract from the natural uh, unspoke character. Um, and so preferably there shouldn't be any development along uh, the requested roadway. Uh, you can go to the next one. So the function and uh, roadway condition, uh, so it must, Operate as a local access road, only serving adjacent property owners. Uh, it should have adequate design, drainage, and safety uh, along that roadway. Um, let's see if there's anything. Uh, so it should just uh, mainly still function properly uh, and uh, specifically be a local road. Uh, we don't uh, allow any natural beauty roads along our primary road system. You can go to the next slide. So vegetation, uh, so the vegetation is measured based on the lineal footage of the road segment and it includes the uh, native vegetation. Uh, so it must uh, have a minimum of 90% uh, vegetation and this is excluding the driveways and uh, any farmland. So we, uh, we go out and we measure the roadway and we come up with basically what that percentage is and we'll present that to the, at the public hearing and to the board. You can move on. So uh, with the 
uh, but so those were all the criteria that we evaluate and we provide a summary uh, and we go through those at the public hearing and we uh, present those to the board. Uh, what we do note and we also uh, stated at the public hearing is our accepted maintenance practices. So in general, uh, Natural Beauty Road should receive the same level of maintenance that was performed on that road prior to the designation. And some of those practices are mowing, uh, so we would still want to maintain that at least one swath uh, of mowing along the edge. Uh, we still uh, would grade the roadway and uh, make sure that there's no uh, roadside berms that uh, along that and, main and maintain the drainage uh, of that roadway. I think we have uh, some more maintenance practices on the next slide. Yep. So then we also maintain the signing. Also included with the sign or with the designation is uh, signs that would go up at the beginning and end of the segment that they're requesting that would say natural beauty. Um, uh, another uh, acceptable maintenance practice is uh, tree trimming and removal. So if there's you know dead trees or trees that are causing sight distance concerns or um, ones that uh, are, you know, similar to what we just talked about in the tree policy uh, that are causing concern for school buses or snow plows or, um, uh, like Barb said, farm equipment, then we would still uh, trim those trees or, or, or remove them. Uh, we also have the ability to maintain the road surface, whether that would be uh, limestone patching or uh, you know, improvements of that surface uh, to maintain what is existing out there. And then uh, lastly, the any safety improvements. So if, like I said earlier, if there's any sight distance concerns or uh, any uh, safety concerns as far as drainage or then we would have that ability to make those improvements. If there's a property owner that moves in along that segment of roadway and they need to maintain site for their new driveway, then they would have that ability to remove any vegetation or uh, trees to make sure that that driveway operates safely. Um, you can move on to the next slide. So just to go through some of our current natural beauty roads. Uh, so in Ann Arbor Township, we have uh, Warren Road. Oh, and I'll give you the, the segments. Uh, so uh, Warren Road between Dixborough Road and Curtis Road, uh, Stein Road between Maple Road and Whitmore Lake Road. Within Sile Township, we have Tubbs Road between Huron River Drive and Stein Road, Marshall Road uh, between Baker and Zeeb. And Superior Township, we have Gale Road between Gettys and Cherry Hill. Um, go to the next slide. In Dexter Township, we have Riker Road, and that's uh, between Island Lake Road and North Territorial Road. Uh, Webster Township, we have Scully Road between Valentine and our northern end of our certification. Um, Lodi Township, there's Tesmer Road between Waters and Ellsworth. Saline Township, we have Hartman Road between Maple and the western end of our certification. Um, and then Manchester Township, we have Marl Road between Sharon Hollow Road and Grossman Road. So those are our current natural beauty roads uh, that we have within our county. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, then we also have, uh, I wanted to show some of the roads that have been denied. Um, and some of these date back to the 70s, so I, I don't know, some of them, I don't know exactly why they were denied, but you know, I'm assuming that in some fashion, they didn't meet some of the criteria that we uh, had reported back. So those uh, are listed here, Ann Arbor Township. We had Orchard Hills Drive, which I believe now is within the city of Ann Arbor, but I could be mistaken. Uh, Bridgewater Township, we have Lima Center, Dexter, we have Wiley and Stinchville Woods, Northfield Township, there was uh, Kearney and Jennings and Salem Township, uh, Brookville. Uh, do we have another slide with some of the denied? Yep, so we have uh, some more um, roadways that have been denied, which were in Sile Township, East Delhi, Park Ridge, 
in Sharon Township, we had uh, Lehman, Bethel Church Road, Webster Township, Vaughn Road, York Township, Judd, and then in Atlanta, we had Merritt Road. Uh, we have also done an evaluation and we have rescinded a natural beauty road. And I believe that's the next slide. Emily, if you want, oh, I don't, I must have missed that one. But uh, we also have one that we've rescinded and that's on Glacier Way. Um, so that's one that, uh, and I believe that was in 1995 uh, that we had uh, rescinded that natural beauty road. And from reading the board minutes, it looks like it was rescinded based on the volume of road had changed, the traffic volume and the vegetation along that roadway had changed. So basically uh, the, uh, that roadway had changed its function and changed how it was operating. Um, so like Cheryl had said uh, at the beginning, we wanted to go through this because we do have a public hearing scheduled for next Tuesday, uh, the 27th at 1 p.m. And uh, here's some information. It's for Earhart Road between Warren and Joy. Um, and so we'll be presenting uh, what we, the criteria that we evaluated and uh, hearing public comment. So with that, I think you can go to the next slide. I think if there's any questions. Brent, I do have a question. Um, yeah. Who's the hearing officer designated for the 27th? Yeah, I will be the hearing officer. Thank you. I have a question on some of the war, um, just one of the, um, the wording at the um, Act 451. I was just wondering, I don't know if it matters or not, but a couple of places I saw where it says that you have to put a notification in a newspaper <laughs> and yeah <laughs> we don't have some places don't have newspapers anymore is that just ignored or no well we we were concerned about that but actually Emily uh in the great job that she does she was able to find uh the ability to have it uh placed within the Sunday newspaper with uh, I believe the Ann Arbor News is that right Emily that's correct, Brent. Yeah, so the Ann Arbor News still publishes uh, printed paper twice a week. And so we had it run um, to make sure that we are compliant with that, uh, Commissioner McCollum. We had it run, um, I think, the, this week and next week. It needed to be the two weeks prior to the meeting. So yeah, we and we have a um, notarized copy that saying that that is happening. But you're right, it is challenging. So we've also published it on our social media for the Road Commission uh, Facebook page and Twitter, we've emailed out to our subscribers for Ann Arbor Township, a notice about the uh, public hearing. And then we've also included a link on our website and in that email that went out uh, asking if people aren't able to make the virtual public hearing that they can provide online comments to the request. So the last time I looked, we had just received one online comment, but we are trying to push the information out in other ways that aren't listed on that act from 1994 because they didn't exist in 1994. <laughs> But the newspaper, we did uh, get that posted as well. Yeah. I yep. guess they just thought the newspaper would be everywhere forever. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. And, and, I, and we did mail out to the um, petitioner and to um, it, residents directly in that said road segment. So we also right. sent a notice, a mailed notice as well to those groups. Yep. Sounds great. And, and then one last thing we did do is we took our message boards uh, that we have and we posted those along the roadway. Uh, and we did that for a week at the beginning of October, and we just put, put them uh, back out there this week, and they'll stay until the public hearing. That sounds great. I just have one more question. The, um, it says the cars from, I read somewhere 1,000 cars too, like 500, and then it said 1,000. Is that going to and from, or is it a total of 1,000 cars? And do you do a traffic study to see that is, 500 or less cars going down the road. Yeah, we uh, do uh, traffic volume collection and we basically, uh, it's a 24 hour count and it's so it's vehicles per day. So it's whether they're traveling one direction or the other direction and it's uh, 500 vehicles per day. Yeah, Commissioner McCollum, I believe um, if you look under our criteria under volume, um, for the designation, we would be looking at um, 
at less than 500 vehicles for consideration as a natural beauty road, but there is a threshold in there that says any increase over a thousand vehicles per day on, on a designated road would automatically warrant consideration for withdrawal of the designation. So it, it's directing staff to take a look at whether or not the natural beauty road designation would still apply under the circumstances. Thank you. I have, I have a question uh, regarding PA 451. It's the first section 702, parent one. Petitioners don't have to live on the roadway being applied for, it seems. They just have to be within, within the township. So I could yep. sign a petition to designate a road as a natural beauty road that I've, I don't live on, have never driven, but I live in that township, is that right? That's correct. And is there a fee applied when people submit their petition after it's validated and certified? No, we, uh, we don't, we don't uh, ask for any fee to uh, recoup any of our costs to evaluate. It's just the service that we provide to the residents. Because in meeting the criteria, it seems to me this could be considerable staff time to go out and you know see how many plants are native and is it a certain percentage? And I know with other permits, there's a cost recovery factor, right? And why isn't there for this one? It's just a practice that over time we haven't asked for. Um, I, I really don't know the history on why we haven't. I, I believe at one point in our road commission history, we did ask for a fee, but I don't know any of the, in my tenure here at the road commission, we've never, we've always done this uh, as part of a service that we provide. And uh, it is, it is considerable staff time and we have a, a, a defined period that we have to uh, perform this in. Uh, and sometimes that can be difficult, uh, you know, based on when we get the request. Um, but uh, I, I guess that can be further discussed, but I, I, I know it's a service that we've just provided and we've uh, done for our residents within Washington County. And can development be denied on a natural beauty road? Once it's designated, no, there was and, the... And that, that's part of, so, <laughs> so occasionally, they seem to come in waves and part of it um, can be uh, land use driven. So it is not uncommon when we get a request that there's actually a land use um, potential change or decision being made by the township. Because remember the road commission doesn't make land use decisions. Those are made by the townships. Um, and that if, if you start becoming familiar with the area and what exactly is going on, um, that often is what is driving the request for the Natural Beauty Road. Um, Brent listed uh, some of the ones of the, that have been denied in the past. And the most recent one that I can remember that we had denied was Brookville Road in Salem Township. Uh, and that was specifically in response, the request for the Natural Beauty Road designation was directly related to Salem Township's decision with the Urban Services District that they were creating around the Godfordson Road interchange. Uh, so it is not uncommon that that happens. Um, again, we go through the full entire process. Um, they are separate. Um, as far as the designation from the land use decisions. If at the end of the day, um, land use decisions are made that are incompatible with the natural beauty road designation, um, should this board have decided to go ahead with that designation um, and then those land use decisions are made that are incompatible, then we may be in a position where we would be withdrawing potentially withdrawing that designation. If the traffic volumes become too high, um, it will not stop uh, tree removal or any form of development along there. So now if all of a sudden the natural features that were previously in place um, or the vegetation that was previously in place is no longer there, this board may withdraw that designation. So that is not an uncommon request, but it also, it, 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 they really don't, um, it does not impact the ultimate decision either for the land use. 
similarly to the um, the tree removal policy, it, is there a way for us to state exactly that, that the road commission does not have authority over land use decisions, nor does it have authority over speed limits? Because I remember that that was also a goal of petitioners for natural beauty roads. They wanted speed limits lowered and they thought if it was a natural beauty road, they could make a, have us do that. So there, there are assumptions that I believe petitioners have in mind when they come and to devote all of this staff time and resources for a purpose that we have no authority to invoke seems like a waste of time. <laughs> and how do we head that off? Well, again, these come in waves and I know that we've had waves of them in the past. Um, you are correct. The request for a lower speed limit is typically the other driving force um, behind these requests. Uh, at one point in time, and I, I don't know if that still exists, the Department of Natural Resources had sort of recommended or suggested a speed limit of 25 miles per hour, uh, which um, petitioners have seen. Uh, state police does not support that, and ultimately we need that traffic control order in place, so that would be an invalid speed limit, so we do not put those up um, associated with the Natural Beauty Road. Bless you, Barb. Um, but uh, that also is another reason why we have received those requests in the past. So uh, if we elect to revise the criteria or the process, I mean, we can't revise the law, although clearly it's an older 26 year old law here that we are dealing with, including things like newspapers that have never been changed. Um, that is an, an effort that we could undertake and we can evaluate whether or not we should be having a fee associated with the process itself. We can evaluate if there's language like you just suggested that this does not change the speed limit, this does not stop land use. Those are things that we could add into our, um, at least the guidelines that we'd be sending out for petitioners when they, um, you know, uh, contact staff about this process. Yeah, and we certainly do have those conversations with the petitioner when they con when they contact us. We inform them that you know land use decisions are based on the township, and uh, this process does not preclude any type of land use decisions, and uh, that you know speed limits are not reduced based on the designation of a natural beauty road. So we have a lot of those conversations with them. Um, and uh, I think in every time I've received a request in my whatever, 18 years here, it uh, uh, they still want to go through the process. And, and that's fine. We, we will perform the evaluation. Uh, and sometimes there are people that want to have it designated because it does get recorded with the state and and, and that's that's fine. But like I said, we we have beautiful roads regardless of the designation throughout our county. So if the designation does not include any land use provisions or anything like that, what protections does the designation provide? It doesn't. It, does, it doesn't. Yeah, it, it provides them a sign to recognize the Natural Beauty Road and it to be recorded with the state of Michigan as, as a natural beauty road. And that's it? Yes. Okay. Well, that's a little bit confusing that we have authority to make that designation, but we have no power over land use or speed limit or anything like that. So that's, that's a lot of, it's very interesting. These can be applied in cities and villages who would have those that ability. Uh, so the same act applies to them. But we don't have jurisdiction over cities and villages. Correct. But it, I mean, to answer Rod's question is there are some entities that would have that ability to uh, make decisions on land use and use this act as another mechanism. Of well, cities and and townships could designate roads without us? Is that what you're saying? No, cities and villages. 
it so, is in so they 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 have they would have to follow the same process okay. if somebody requested within their jurisdiction okay i want to i agree with uh commissioner bob fuller that there should be some sort of cost analysis of this process and um, see if it's worth uh, adding a, a cost of a permit. Maybe yeah. along the lines of an application fee? Something, um, yes. We can, we can look into that. I mean, I'd really be interested in your, your recommendations. It just, it, it doesn't seem like it means anything other than you get a sign to say, isn't this a beautiful road? But beyond that, it, it doesn't it doesn't do anything. That's and a reasonable it, appreciation, Barb. What's that? I said that is a reasonable appreciation. I just, um, and especially given how much, what appears to me to be staff time devoted to evaluating whether a road should be granted this designation or not, I just, I don't understand why we do this. <laughs> well, first of all, we do it because it's the law <laughs> and it exists. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> and it is I'm a process. I'll give you that, that we, one, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, okay. Silly me goes back to that. Um, so, I, I mean, first and foremost, obviously, that is why we do it. Uh, I, this, um, I, I mean, it is correct that it, that it does not impact things like uh, land use. It doesn't impact uh, site distance standards with respect to a driveway permit. It, it doesn't have a lot of those impacts. But for some people, it is incredibly meaningful to have this designation for their road. They're very proud of this. They want this designation. Um, this is how they're viewing their, uh, you know, where they live. And it's important to them. And we've had people for no other reason than that come in and, and want that designation and those signs put up at either end of their roadway. So I don't want to completely uh, trivialize it either because we do have people that this is very important for and they really, they're not trying to do any of the things we just talked about. They're not trying to stop development. They're not looking for a speed limit sign, although I'm sure they would love one if they had it. Um, they really just want that designation and they're willing to go through the process on their end. And again, these come in waves and they are time consuming for staff when they come in. Uh, we can go years without this. And then it can, we can sometimes do two or three of these that feels like back to back. So um, when they do come in, they're time consuming, but um, they are not a, a terribly regular occurrence on our behalf, at least not right now. This is a topic that Cheryl and I discussed um, and Brent is certainly aware of it. Um, one of the recent, relatively recent changes um, to use on the section of road that's being discussed is the fact that um, there is a new school that was built um, at the, what would be the northeast corner of Joy and uh, Elk. Uh, forgive me, senior moment, uh, the road we're discussing here. Um, Spiritus Sanctus Academy was built right there. And I want to make very sure that our traffic counts reflect the presence of that school. Uh, when that's being discussed at the public hearing, as it will be, I'm sure. Um, Earhart, thank you. Um, I don't know how many vehicle trips uh, that school um, generates. That would be an interesting piece of information in addition to, you know, which affects joy specifically, because I think all the, the egress and um, ingress to that school are from joy. Um, the other thing I would like to comment on personally is I'd sure be appreciative if all of our commissioners who will ultimately have to discuss this uh, at a board meeting uh, can find time to actually drive that road during the week would be useful. Um, and uh, 
see what you think of its present state. Um, I'm not sure right now that based on vehicle count that I can see um, that it falls into the category of the vehicle count, whether the vehicle count is the 500 um, or the 1000 that's also mentioned. Um, I don't that isn't my feel for the road, but I have not sat out there for a 24 hour period and counted either. But I'm really, really, really uh, concerned with that particular aspect. Um, how many people signed the petition that we have? Brent? I mean, is it 20 people? Is it two people? Is it what? Well, they need to have at least 25. Right. Um, I believe they had, let me look to see. But uh, how many they actually had? And they've all been verified and correct as residents of that township. Twenty-eight. So they okay, fewer than I would have thought. Um, that road for reasons that I'm sure we'll go into later, has been the, the source of a great deal of aggravation for the township government um, because of land use decisions. So, uh, right, And again, the, the signatures are just to start the petition process. It's not right. necessarily indicating a level of support. Um, but that's information we can share with this board as well as all of the data collection, traffic counts, percentage of vegetation, all of those things will be um, compiled by staff and presented to this board um, as well as part of the decision-making process. Cheryl, you were the county highway engineer then. How many years has it been since we considered Brookville Road? Three, four, five? It's been since I was on the board. 2015. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. I remember the public hearing, but I didn't remember the date. Yeah. Elena and I were at that one. Yeah, so just to give you some reference, uh, we looked at Test Road in 2006, and then the next request that we received was in 2015. So and then we actually evaluated another one, another one after that in Park Ridge, and that was in 2017. Okay. So they do seem to sometimes come in waves. Right. Um, but that kind of gives you a reference of right. the time frame between them. It just seems to me that people who seek this, other than the exception that you described, Cheryl, where people just want their road to be declared naturally beautiful, uh, that they come with a, an expectation that this is going to be some kind of a piece of leverage to substantiate their objection to something else. And I just don't want the road commission put in the middle of all of this. You gave us a designation. You can't do this. So... Understood. And we normally are, I mean, we're working very closely with the township. They don't have a role in this per se, but we certainly are informing them of what's going on. They um, assist with the validation of the petition as far as the signatures go. Um, so we are working with whichever township this road, uh, the roads are located in when we're going through this process so that they too are aware of the requests and what is coming, what is going on. So Cheryl, I'm assuming that the townships have no authority to make that designation because it almost seems like they should be the ones doing it. That is correct. They do not have jurisdiction. It is ultimately the certification of that road is ours. Okay. So if the township wanted it to mean something, they could incorporate that into their ordinances or their processes. Well, again, we have jurisdiction, so I'm not sure if a township 
I'm not sure what role or how, what the township would be designating versus the, the road commission. The only place that I'm aware of us having dual jurisdiction or authority over things uh, is, is trucking with respect to commercial vehicle restrictions. But again, it just emphasizes the need to work together with respect to the land use and transportation, which is something we do with townships on a daily basis. Cheryl, can the townships themselves weigh in on whether a road should receive a designation? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, we, we ask the township for a resolution. Uh, it's just part of our checklist. And, and they, they can choose not to act on it or in some most cases, I think, I believe they do. Okay, thank but you that's not one of our criteria. Right. That it have township support or not, right? No, it's not. Again, this just seems like an exercise that, <laughs> with no purpose. <laughs> Absolutely feel good measure. Okay, yeah. Any other questions? Well, again, the, um, the actual public hearing for Earhart Road is a week from today. Um, so that will be a virtual meeting. And then um, we will be compiling all of that and bringing that before this board for a determination um, shortly after that, Brent. I guess I'm not sure how quickly we think we'd bring, be bringing this back before the board. Yeah, we'll leave a comment open for a period of time. I, uh, our intent is to bring a summary to the board, to the Road Commission board, the second meeting in November. Brent, I have one more question and then I, I will certainly be quiet, but um, what is the name of the current uh, Ann Arbor Township uh, supervisor? Diane O'Connell. Uh, as part of your normal process, O'Connell or O'Donnell, did you say? I'm sorry. O'Connell. Okay. Uh, is part, part of your normal process um, asking the supervisor if she wants, in this case, she wants to designate someone from the township to represent the township board at this meeting, at the public hearing, I mean? Uh, we send all the information to them. We don't specifically require them to no, have a representative no. there. Uh, we, I've talked to Diane several times about this process and, uh, I, I believe they'll have somebody, uh, participate in the public okay. hearing. Thank you. Commissioners, any other comments? I have none. Again, I'd like everybody to... Um, if they can uh, make a trip down that road, um, it's easy to get to, which is, of course, part of the problem. So uh, but that way you get some sense of what takes place on it. So um, I'd be open then to a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I have a if somebody has a question, please. Yeah, I, I thought I saw our attorney here at some point. You did? He was here for the tree policy. And then he asked me if he needed to stay. And I said, no, he was welcome to leave. Okay. Um, so I did tell him if there's questions, I'd be happy to reach back out to him if necessary. No, I just saw him and then never heard from him and wondered what happened. <laughs> I probably should have opened it up for him, but he, I, I think was, I mean, he'd seen the policy a bunch of times and was really right. there to answer if, if the board had had any legal questions with respect to the tree policy. That okay. was my intent in inviting him. I should okay. have at least allowed him a moment or two to speak and didn't realize until we were done that that moment had passed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I support the motion to adjourn. I never heard the motion. 
Oh. I made a motion, Gloria. Yeah, I must okay. a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Rod. Um, that will require, of course, a, a roll call vote. Commissioner Barb Fuller. Barbara Fuller, Vice Chair of the Road Commission, participating virtually, live in Sharon Township in the County of Washtenaw, the state of Michigan. <laughs> I don't I don't think we need all of that for for everyone else, but your your point's taken. Anyway, did you vote yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Green. Yes. Oh, goody. Uh, Commissioner Yamas? Yes. Commissioner McCollum? Yes. And Doug Fuller votes yes as well. I believe we stand adjourned.